The following program is classified G. It's suitable for all ages. We would like to remind our viewers that the views expressed in this program by our participating guests are solely viewpoints of them who take part and does not reflect the views and beliefs of the Verena Media Network. And welcome to Gen XYZ. This is a program where we talk about contemporary issues or topics based on the youth. Now, recently it was International Women's Day, and as we all know, the world is talking about women's issues, gender based violence, female rights, and that's, that's basically around March and at the end of the year people used to forget all about what we talk about but today on the show we are here to talk about an organization called Every Story uh, Sri Lanka and this organization is a young feminist organization who are here to promote feminism and give a chance to showcase every woman's story in their lives and what they have gone through. So with that, I would really like to invite Vidya Kumara Singh, who is the co-founder of this organization, and also Abhilesha Sagar, who is the programs manager for the Stories of Sri Lanka Women's Project. Thank you both of you for taking the time to join me on the show today, and I'm excited to talk about this topic as well. My first question would pose to you, Vidya. Now, Every Story Sri Lanka, could you give our audience a little bit of what this organization is about and what you all do? Um, <laughs> I, I will try to start with the origin story because then it makes sense. Um, Sharana and I, the other co-founder, uh, work in feminist spaces, in research. Um, a lot of it was around gender-based violence. Um, and then we had this discussion about how there is a gap in children's books for Sri Lankan children um, and books that are feminist, have female leads that, are, that represent what we actually look like in the books rather than you know, characters based in Britain or America. And then we decided, you know what, like, let's do it, let's just do it. Um, so we just did it, we decided to get together and do it and we also were very clear that we should pay ourselves because as two young people in our, their early 20s, I think you run the risk of having all these passion projects that don't, that you can't balance against also having to earn like your living and building a career. So we were like, you know what, we'll block our time, we'll pay ourselves even if it's 500 rupees and sit down and do this work. So we sit at Sharanya's parents' table at home um, and we used to talk and talk and talk and to this day everyone still laughs about how we did this talk. But that did shape a lot of what you see now because it was a lot of, you know, when this grows, it, we want it to be like this, we want it to be like that. Um, so the children's book idea did, uh, we did produce that. But in, when we were doing it, we realized actually what we wanted to do was use the stories as a vehicle for the kind of values um, and principles we want to communicate. So as my, the books were about representation, but actually it was, it was about getting kids to think critically, um, to think about issues that they face with, like grief, um, or issues with parents, and having a new family member, and how families can look different. So all of that was to generate empathy, to think critically, to, um, to talk about consent in very different ways. Then we, we were commissioned to do um, an exhibition in New York, uh, collecting stories of South Asian girls um, who are resisting kind of patriarchal norms in their own way. And that's when we became the version you know now as every story. So we identify as a feminist storytelling and knowledge sharing collective, uh, which is a lot of lingo, but uh, the storytelling is again a vehicle for sharing what we want the world to look like, uh, which is a more equal and equitable world. Um, but also ref for it to be based in South Asia and like South Asian values because you see a lot of this representation and discussion um, from a more like Western perspective, 
but not enough from our history, our oral traditions, uh, from a Sri Lankan perspective and a South Asian perspective. So uh, and the knowledge sharing part really comes with our work uh, with young women, uh, young women and girls, because there is a huge gap in knowledge about thinking about current affairs um, or history through a critical feminist lens. Uh, there is that gap in information and access to knowledge. So we wanted to address that. That is what we do. So what is the final vision you all have in this organization? How would you describe that? Um, so for us, it's about building an equal and equitable world. Um, and because we say feminist people do sometimes not fully understand how that manifests in our work. And the way I try to explain that is that for us it's about feminist values of equality, uh, choice, um, agency, um, etc. And, and it's important to us that that manifests in every single thing we do. So in the way we organize ourselves, the way we pay people, um, to the way we design programs. And so when we say equal, everyone thinks of feminism as equality and equity, but for us it's also about dismantling structures because you can't build the world that we want to build without also taking, up, taking it apart. Um, and that's what we... All right. Uh, so Abhilesha, how did you get involved with ESSL? Okay, so actually when I was on a career break after having my first child, I was doing some freelance uh, things. Uh, so at that time I got a call from Sharanya Sekram, as uh, Vidya said, she's one of our co-founders. Uh, so she was explaining about the concept that they had in their mind about every story of Sri Lanka and I really liked it. Then I wanted to have a chat with Sharanya to see like whether it, it's something that I can work on or whether it's, it's an organization that I can join for. Then I went and I met Sharanya and when I was talking to her that was a very interesting conversation that we did. She shared a lot of feminist values that aligned with my principles and what I believe in about feminism. And also more than everything because I had a child so my son was only about one year at that time. So Sharanya also assured uh, a working environment that will help me to manage my motherhood and also the work. So it's been nearly two years since I've been a part of Every Story Sri Lanka and I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity I get and there had been so many instances where my son was with me for the meetings and also uh, when the COVID settled a little bit we had physical meetings. So even during that time I used to take my son with me for the meeting. So Every Story Sri Lanka is an organization which actually supports uh, females to like do their work and also motivates them to like balance their work and life. So in that way I should say that um, it's wonderful to be a part of this team and being a part of Every Story Sri Lanka is a life-changing experience is what I would say. That's amazing to hear. If you could give like a more elaborate identity to ESSL, would you be able to tell about some of the projects that you all have done so far and what's the current project you all are working on right now? Uh, right now we're actually working on many projects. Like there are so many projects which we started like few few years back and all of those projects are still going on. Um, if I am to start with, maybe if I talk about the Young Feminist Network. So through Young Feminist Network what we try to do is like we try to uh, gather young women and girls who are interested in feminism, gender related issues and activism. Uh, we give them the opportunity to learn from each other, challenge each other, to get a mentorship from each other and we provide that space uh, for young women and girls through Young Feminist Network. Uh, then the other project is what Vidya mentioned, as Vidya mentioned, it's the Resistance Stories project. So th that is how we started Every Story Sri Lanka. So the first project that we started working on was the Resistance Stories project. So under that we collected the stories of young girls. Young girls means like girls who are below 18 years. So we collected stories uh, covering the South Asian region and that included stories from Sri Lanka, India, Pakistan, Nepal and Bangladesh. And when you read those stories, you would not imagine what those 
18 year old or like the girls who are below 18 year old have gone through their life and how they have come over it it's unimaginable is what I would say like those stories are like so inspirational and we have com completed the phase one of that work and now we are working with a regional team uh, to work on the second phase of those stories to like uh, publish that stories around the uh, regions uh, based with that inspiration of working on resistance stories only like we thought like we've been collecting stories of these girls and if we think of Sri Lanka like there are like so many women who have done so many things in different fields but if you just think of collecting something or if you, even if you want to just think of a Sri Lankan women who have done so many things in different fields there's no specific place where you can just go and refer to it then we thought like why don't we collect the stories of Sri Lankan women then that's how we started the, working on the project called stories of Sri Lankan women and under that project we actually collect the stories of women from 20th and 21st century so basically uh, the women whom we cover under this project are like where their lives and experiences were shaped and have been shaped by our own social political and cultural context because that's what why we that is what we see as important about this project as i said you before like it's very little amount like I, we can i just count the number of stories that we can see in sri lanka about the sri lankan women uh, so under that like we got a funding from the embassy of netherlands and with that funding we worked on publishing about 30 stories and right now those stories are available on our social media pages for anyone to uh, look at and apart from the stories of sri lankan women we also work on some publications and the f right now we are on the first stage of that project and we are working on creating a nutrition booklet for children from 4 to 10 for them to like understand the importance of nutritional uh, foods and for them to like uh, understand why they should not go for junk foods and stuff so basically these are the projects that we are working on but out of all of these our flagship project is the stories of Sri Lankan women project all right I think our audience got a very good idea about <laughs> what ESL's projects are and what y'all are currently working on but we'll be discussing about every story in Sri Lanka even more further after the break you're watching Gen XYZ we'll be back soon Welcome back to Gen XYZ and in our first segment I think we spoke about what every story Sri Lanka is all about and the projects that y'all are currently handling and also I think Abhilesha you told us about the current program that y'all are ha handling as well, uh, stories of Sri Lankan women. Uh, Vidya I would like to ask you now these projects y'all have been doing so far, how successful were they and what kind of impact did these projects make on the community? Um, in <laughs> We're very, we've been told we're overly modest about our impact and success. Um, and a lot of what we do know about our success has come from the feedback we've got. Uh, and a lot of our appreciation for our work is about how we, do, we, we don't feature people who are just Columbo-centric or like English-speaking Columbo-centric. Uh, we all of our work is trilingual, everything, even our social media posts, if someone goes onto our Instagram, they'll see that it's in single Tamil and English, everything. Uh, and that's very important to us. So we get a lot of feedback about how our work is very accessible. Um, and those who funded us, one was uh, the Frida Young Feminist Fund. They're very excited about our work. Um, and other organizations who are in this space have been very supportive. And it is encouraging because a lot of people will say, you know, y'all really walk the talk. Um, and that has been wonderful to hear because we were also very conscious of not doing something for the show or for the sake of it. Uh, so much so we have, I think our social media doesn't fully cover all of the things, the breadth of what we do. Because it's not about showing what we're doing. It's more about us, us knowing that we have done something properly. In terms of impact, we try to not think about likes and views. Um, during the pandemic, we started a, a webinar series. Uh, we are focused on a lot of our work tends to think about ch young children in the early childhood 
education period that's three to seven years old. That's where kids, uh, and there's a lot of research on this now, um, but how that's when kids form their ideas about gender and stereotypes and norms. So by the time they get to primary school, it's actually a bit too late. So you need to inculcate those values and ideas much earlier on. And our webinar series covered everything from how parents can manage working from home while a kid is also at home, so sort of creating boundaries and routine, to working with children with um, learning difficulties and different abilities. And also, for, I mean, interesting, we had an entire session on fatherhood um, and navigating fatherhood because definitely my um, friends and acquaintances and people we know, the fathers are much, much more involved um, and don't want to be just sort of passive parents. And I think previous generations, even if you wanted to be involved, it was very difficult because the father is not seen to be doing that. Um, and they made fun of, whereas you see a younger generation of women, men who are like, no, this is, I am an equal parent, you know, and how can I, how can I be involved and how can I be an equal parent? And those discussions were really, really interesting. Um, and I think our, a big portion of our, um, I think our impact really spread from that. Um, particularly because we spoke about it in Sinhala and Tamil. And we saw the way that the registrations and views on those videos were far more in Sinhala and Tamil. Because you don't see um, that subject area being covered by more traditional media. You might have access to it in English, um, especially if you're computer literate, you can go and find it. But in Sinhala and Tamil, some of those topics weren't talked about in a Sri Lankan context. Um, the other thing about our impact is we recently had a reception hosted by the Dutch Embassy who fun funded our uh, so Stories of Sri Lankan Women work um, because she felt like it was important, the ambassador felt it was important to bring us all together. Um, and the kind of feedback we got from these women we've interviewed who we respect and admire so much was really inspiring and I think confirmed that we were onto something and we were doing something right. Uh, they all spoke about how they appreciated that it wasn't, we covered different classes, we covered different parts of the country, different languages, different areas, everything from business to art to like sports, everything was covered and that diversity was really appreciated. All right. Now, something which I picked up was on in the first segment also your, you mentioned that your vision is to promote the build and build culture, society and the world that is truly equal and equitable, centered on intersectional feminist principles. Now, the latest project you all are doing is uh, Stories of Sri Lankan Women. How do you plan on achieving this vision through this project as telling stories as a vehicle? So one, I think the, ma the kind of core tenet of stories of Sri Lankan women is representation. Um, and for us, it was also very much about recording history because you don't get, like Abhilesha mentioned before, those, this, you can't find these stories in the way that other sort of men's stories and male politicians and um, key person's stories are recorded. You don't see the women's stories recorded, even those those who are quite famous um, and celebrated. So for us, it's about recording that story and saying it as it is, but also sharing all of the ups and downs. So when we talk about female leaders or someone who's famous and achieves something, that women also make mistakes, make bad decisions, can also be bad people, and that's part of, for us, that's important. So we don't, we try to not, not sort of wash it and make it presentable and that these people are role models in any way. They are inspiring because of what, how they have dealt with their circumstances. And for us, we want young people and kids to see these stories, to read about these stories and like, look at these women and think, you know what, like I can do that too. That's right. Abhilesha, do you have anything to add on to that as well? Now, you're the programs manager for yeah. this particular project, and what's your experience on this? 
um, experience on working on this project is like really different because uh, apart from what Vidya mentioned, if I am to speak about how the process of collecting these stories worked on, uh, we actually included all women, like the, all the writers, the illustrators, and the translators, like everyone who has worked on this project are all women. Initially, it was actually challenging for us to like find women to work on this particular project, uh, especially for illustrations and all, it was difficult, but still we managed to find people. And um, it's, we, 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 we could also say like this project is all about women and it's like put together by women. So that is also wonderful and also if we talk about this project, when we were doing the interviews like there had been many instances where some of our interviewees, them like they mentioned like they had been, they had got so many opportunities to do interviews but during all of those opportunities like they've been able to speak about the achievements whereas like they've not got an opportunity to speak about the life journey as like how or under what context that they've been able to oh, achieve what they have achieved so like they were very happy that they got the opportunity to speak to us because sometimes if you just ask them only one question they would like answer for like so long it's because we could feel the happiness in them of speaking about their own life journey. So when we were doing that, like I realized that how important the work, what we do, what we are doing, and like how important it is to like collect those stories and archive. Because if just just even to when we talk to a small child, if you say like, see, uh, she has achieved something, it's not what is going to make an impact to a child. Instead, if we say like, this is what she went through to achieve this, and that is what is going to make an impact to a child, and that's what we are trying to do through these stories. With your experience, what was the response you received? How do you filter these stories and select these women to share their stories? And were they all comfortable in sharing their stories with y'all? For the most part, yes. Um, we, because we also come from a research background, we do think of consent very seriously uh, and when we go to approach someone we do a uh, we have a consent form and every element of the interview has a separate clause for consent so your voice recording the transcript uh, the particular contents of an interview all of it is has separate that uh, has a separate consent clause so at any given time they can say sorry you know actually i don't want my voice recording in public and i don't want that you know if you can delete it after you use it um, and then there have been uh, i think we've had one instance where someone has done the interview and said you know actually i don't want it this to be public at all uh, which was rare but most times people are happy to share these stories, especially because of the way we do it and the kind of questions we answer. We've had instances where someone said, oh, you know, you can go on my website. I've done hundreds of interviews. And they will say, no, actually, the kind of questions we ask are a little bit different. Can we send you a sample? Mm -hmm. They're like, all oh, right, this is different. Um, and like Abhilesh said, during interviews, we've had so many of the women we've interviewed say how it was an interesting experience for them because they hadn't really thought about their journey in that way. Sometimes you're just doing what you have to do and you're like fighting and you're, you know, you're putting up a good fight, but you don't have a chance to sit back and think, all oh, right, you know, I have done this for myself and I overcame this in this way. And also exactly. adding to what Vidya said, uh, I should also say that these stories were shared with every story because all the women we interviewed, they trust the process that we adapted to collect these stories. Mm. Like mainly because of that process, it was it's it was a very transparent process. And even during the interview, like before before recording it, we'll say like we're going to record it. And if you feel like you're not comfortable of sharing something on a recording, just let us know. So. I would say it's basically the trust that they had on our process that made them to like share their stories with us. Mm. All right, to continue further with the discussion, we'll just go into a short commercial break. You're watching Gen XYZ. We'll be back soon. Welcome back to Gen XYZ. Now, I think before we went to the break, I think Vidya was explaining about and Abhilesha as well about how comfortable women are to expressing their stories for this particular project. Uh, now, the question which I want to get your point is, 
how do you filter out these stories how do you select these women in order to collect their stories and make it public uh, we have a, a running list which I think is now at about 350 to 400 names. It's those we've, I mean, if there's a newspaper article, we'll pick up on that name. Uh, we've had a lot of people recommend people to us from different industries. But for the first 30, um, just to launch the concept, we made sure that we represented all the different subject areas and that it wasn't. It, it was people who spoke different languages from different parts of the country. So we were a little careful in just presenting um, th that first 30. But our list is extensive. Um, and it's not just people who've, women who've achieved, sort of they're the first woman to do something or that they've reached the highest position. It's if they've, they are everyday, everyday people who've done something inspiring or challenging. So we have the story of um, um, uh, Hansika. Hansithi. Hansika. Hansika. Sorry. Hansika, who is the, f the first female motorcycle racer in the country. Uh, she's only 17 years old. Um, and it's so interesting for her how she's like, you know, I really like doing this. I watched it as a kid. Her parents also watched the racing and were involved in that community. So she started racing, and for her, it was just something that she wanted to do. Um, and so it's a, lot of, it's a lot of stories like that. Um, when we initially started out, we, every, every story used to be called alternative narratives. Um, it was a too long a name, so we had to change it. But I think that speaks to our attitude to filtering. For us, we want to go beyond what is obvious and already there to things that are in the alternative, you know, like other stories that are not part of the mainstream. All right. Abhilesha, what is your experience? Now, being the programs manager, you would have been getting all these stories to your table. And is there any th story that you would like to share with us and the audience that actually made an impact on you and you thought, wow, this is a life-changing experience and this is very important for people to know? Uh, to be very honest, if I am to pick one story, I feel that I'm doing injustice to the, all the other stories that we have collected. Um, for me, uh, all the stories or all the life journeys are unique and inspirational in its own way. So it's very difficult to pick one story. But I can just share like two or three stories which are like somewhat different and inspirational in some way. Uh, one is, I would say, Niluka Gunavardhana. She's actually, she's a um, disability rights advocate. Um, when we were interviewed her, she said like it took about 20 years for her to realize that she, there's nothing wrong with her. Actually, she was born without her left forearm. Uh, after so many difficulties, today she is a disability rights advocate. So it should have been the case. It shouldn't have taken 20 years for her to realize that there's nothing wrong with her. So through that story, like if somebody else is reading that story in the community, either they can bring this uh, awareness of realization that just a physical disability is not a disability to anyone. So that realization should come far more than what she realized. So that's something that we can share with the community through that story. And if I talk about another story, I would speak about Hanusha Somasundaram. She's an artist from Hatton. So her parents were plantation workers. So during her childhood, uh, I don't know whether you heard about this, they say like crutch or clutch, I think, it's like where the plantation workers usually leave their children and go to work. So like they, her father and mother, both of them were plantation workers and they used to leave her in the clutch and go. Uh, like even her childhood was like very difficult. But today she's been represented by Saskia's, uh, Saskia's Fernando Art Gallery and using tea bags, tea strainers, um, and tea cups, she's trying to portray the difficulties faced by plantation workers. And today she's, re she's recognized as a contemporary artist in that way. And uh, um, another uh, very famous story that I would like to pick is Ramani Fernando. So everyone would know Ramani Fernando. And what they know about Ramani Fernando is like she's the founder of Ramani Fernando Saloons. But if we actually go back and see where she started her journey, like in London, she was just walking on the streets to uh, streets looking for job. So even when she got the opportunity at her first job, she was struggling to do a, a small trim. 
Uh, so then the owner of the shop has like firmly and strongly told her that please just gain some experience and come back. So that's how her journey was started. So it's like she did not give up at that first instance. So it's not only these stories. Like if you go through our social media pages and read through each and every story, as I said before, it's unique and inspirational in its own way. Vidya, is there anything you would like to share as well on your experience on uh, this? Um, again, I find it hard to I find struggling to pick one story. I was definitely thinking about Ramni Fernando's story, whom we now know as a sort of fashion icon, and she's incredibly sophisticated, um, and she has this business empire. But she, I, I listened to her interview when we were editing the stories, and she's an incredibly humble and hardworking person who also invests a lot of effort in her staff um, and people she trains. And something that came out in the final uh, text is that she said she's really proud of how many people she trained and worked for her have gone on to open their own salons. For her, she, like, she believes that is a moment of something to be proud of, that you have contributed something. The other story that um, uh, I spent a lot of time with is uh, Amila Dimel, the architect, who said, you know, I don't know if I'm feminist and like, you know, I don't know if I've had the same challenges because I'm a woman, I, you know, um, who's inc achieved incredible, in, sort of has, is this an award-winning, I think, um, an incredible architect. But for us, immediately what was striking was how she questions the system. So she does a lot of low cost house, she did a low cost housing project, um, public housing. And she's like, well, you know, if that kind of housing doesn't have to be the way everyone thinks it should look like. It doesn't have to just be a block of flats. It doesn't have to be a two bedroom, one bathroom thing. Why can't low cost housing be nice? Why can't low cost housing serve the people who are actually going to live in it? And I, to us, that for us is resistance. Yes, you can win awards and you can build amazing buildings and beautiful and amazing buildings. But for us, what was inspiring was someone who asked questions. Um, they actually asked, someone had the interview had asked her, um, if you had a dream project, what would you build? And she said, no, we have enough building. We, need, we shouldn't be building things. Um, and that's really interesting coming for an architect because she, she thinks a lot about the environment and a sense of place. It's not building for the sake of building. It's creating something that is required by the environment and the people. So from this project, what do you think is the biggest takeaway you can get? And what can people earn from this project, uh, Stories of Sri Lankan Women? Um, biggest takeaway, I would say, um, we, we all have read that like life can give million reasons for you to like give up your dreams. But we should find at least one opportunity for us to like follow our dream. So I would say like all of these stories that we have collected, that is what the stories are like saying to us. And also especially as we mentioned before, uh, when you read a story that is closer to your own cultural context and own environment, when you like work through something, it's easy for you to relate to what's happening. So instead of like, we usually have the opportunity of reading a lot of Western world women who have succeeded and who are inspirational in many ways. But actually speaking, we can't connect their lifestyles and that culture with our own culture. But if we speak about the Sri Lankan women's stories, because they've been lived in the same environment we are living right now. So it's easy to like connect and identify how they have come over those struggles and like in, as I said, so we need to just, for me, we need to like find at least that one reason to follow our dreams and like I would say all the women whom we have interviewed are like uh, women who have found at least one reason to like succeed uh, in their life out of the millions of struggles they had come across. All right. Now the current project is stories of yeah. uh, Sri Lankan women. What does the future of uh, Every Story Sri Lanka look like? What is your future expansion plans or what's coming up next? Um, in the short run, we really want to develop stories of Sri Lankan women. Um, that is a, a key component of our work. We do a lot of publications work in, around the early childhood period that we want to expand on. Um, right now, I'd say our focus is a lot on stories of Sri Lankan women. In the long run, uh, we have so many dreams. Um, but we want to remain true to our founding principles. 
Um, we spoke earlier about youth organizations. Um, before the actual interview, where in our chat we talked about young youth organizations, and we are we very strongly believe that for it for our purpose to be taken forward, our thinking has to remain has to come from and be shaped by young people. So, Iran an organization is under 35 years old, um, and a bulk of the work is actually done by those in their 20s, um, and we will. I mean, all of us will move on from this organization at some point in the next few years, but it will be taken over by someone who will further the cause in their own way, because it can't be, like, killed by us. I think they will det determine what the future looks like for every story. All right, now I'm getting many follow-up questions after you <laughs> said that, but we'll definitely continue the discussion. Let's go into a short commercial break. You're watching Jennings Rising. Welcome back to Gen XYZ and we were talking about Every Story Sri Lanka and we were talking about their vision and their projects, what they are projecting right now and their current project which they are working on which is Stories of Sri Lankan Women and uh, why don't you tell our audience about how people can be involved in helping your vision come true. How can they help you all to do this? Um, so this two ways. One is by joining our actual team. Uh, we're rec recruiting for a couple of roles at the moment because our workload is increasing rapidly and our small team of seven people can't manage. So we are constantly hiring people. Um, we have a database of artists, uh, illustrators, writers, lots of resource people who we call on from time to time. The other way is that we have a lot of um, people in the community who volunteer their time. So we have you know, those who work in finance, in banking, who say, I can't, I don't have the time to, I can't fully com commit to a part-time role, but I can offer my expertise in managing our financials. Uh, we, we also need funding for the work we do. Um, Stories of Sri Lankan Women program in particular, Abhilesha can um, tell you more about it we have factored in how much it costs to cover one interview. So we've had organizations and individuals who come forward and say, I, I'd like to sponsor X amount, like three, three stories of women um, who are in technology or women in the performing arts. Uh, and that, so this funding thing is, I think, something really important. Um, but it doesn't have to be about money. And I, I want to stress, um, there's quite a few people who donate their time and their skills towards it. So even if it's something very gentle like feedback, um, constructive criticism, you know, you all did it this way, but what if you all did it that way? Think about doing your social media in this way. To a very specific set of skills, we've had people come, come up, volunteer and say, you know, I'm a very good writer. I used to be a reporter. I can do one of the interviews for you. I'll donate my time. I can donate five hours of my time. And um, yeah. And also like we had some people coming because for our first funding we still haven't done the translations for our stories like most of the stories are in English and there are few in Sinhala and Tamil and we even had some volunteers coming up and saying that I can do the translations for you all the entire write-up so if there are any volunteers as Vidya said can't financially support us but they can give their skill of translation to us and also more than that like as we mentioned before we have a like long list of women so maybe if they find some women as inspiring and if they think that women could be in their list, they can just write, to, uh, write an email to us and say that why don't you consider including these women in our project. And also as Vidya said, like we have a pool of resources like because we have conducted webinars, we are conducting learning circles on the Young Feminist Network, so we have speakers relating to feminism, gender related issues and activism. Mm -hmm. So even if somebody else wants recommendation for a speaker or uh, for something else, we have a pool of resource persons with us so we can give them free recommendations or else like if somebody else wants to like do collect stories like how we did in some other some other way we can just provide the materials what we have so like we are also willing to uh, get support from them and also to offer the possible support 
to build this community. So, so far, what was the responses you all received, like the response in helping your organization to build this up? Uh, is it higher than usual or is it as expected or how is that going? I don't think we had any expectations. We were just trying to do something small in our own way, um, using our skill set and experience um, and interest in the subject. And the way we've grown is completely unexpected. Um, I don't think Charan and I ever thought it would be the way it is now. The amount of people who reached out to support us, um, who say, who go and promote us when they're, you know, I think people say that it, what matters is what they say when you're not actually in front of them. Um, and we've had so many people we admire and respect when talk about posit us positively um, in other spaces which have attracted opportunities for us. And that has been, that has been uh, very encouraging. Uh, is there something is, you want to add? Um, I think you've covered. Uh, what can you say to the people, some encouraging words for the people out there so that they have a reason to join you all and help you all? <laughs> So um, when we spoke about what Young Feminist Network, uh, there is a general, it is about, well, it's called the Young Feminist Network. But what's interesting about that network is that they are not necessarily people who work in um, like think tanks or research or activism or like human rights. It's everyday people, like girls and women who work in like banks and in technology. But for them, they, are, they want to think critically about gender and their experiences and how they solve problems um, by also like thinking it through a feminist lens. So you won't, we're not, you know, we have a lot of people who subscribe to our newsletter, which is what YFN puts out. Because it's a really interesting re, uh, knowledge, tool for spreading knowledge. Um, and it's not prescriptive and it's not too theoretical. We'll give, we'll sort of cover a certain theme, but it's a way of looking at something new in a different way. And we provide everything from like TV episodes to podcasts to like journal articles. So you can increase your knowledge base and the way you think about the world in a more critical way. So it's not just for, even if you don't identify as a feminist, um, you're more than welcome to come and access our resources. All right, now when working on these projects, I mean, I really want to know more about these stories that y'all are receiving. Uh, tell me a little about your company as well. Now, when you're recruiting people, what sort of attitude are you expecting people to have in order to work with y'all? Um, so, we, we are advertisements if someone's in the call out for the organization, we do say priority will be given to those who identify as women, um, non-binary or LGBTQ plus. Um, and that doesn't mean men can't apply. We always get emails and messages about, oh, why can't men apply? No, of course men can apply. It's about meeting the qualifications. But we also want to create avenues for those who are underrepresented in um, workspaces to have a chance to apply for these roles. We are also very flexible um, and very different working environment. So we do, we, like for example, when Ablesha came on, like uh, we did, it wasn't such a big deal for us to adapt around someone who, who you know, has to drop their kid to school. Um, we have those who have various disabilities and illnesses and challenges and adapting around that isn't, it is a very accommodating workplace. Um, and we can provide a safe workplace, so we do give priority to that. Um, our recruitment system is, I'd say very, uh, we all interview the candidate together. So it's not, there are no, we try to as much as we can to not have hierarchies in our organization, it's very horizontal. So everyone from the most junior officer to um, senior program officers will interview the potential candidate because we all have to get along and work together. It's about building a team with 
potential rather than ticking boxes all right now i think we are we have reached the end of our show as well as an ending note i would like to get your thoughts on giving a small message as women's international women's day was just celebrated a few days ago so what can you say to the world right now and to the women out there a few words of encouragement um, i would say like for anyone who wants to achieve something in their life there could be something that is avoiding them from achieving it could be another human or rules regulations or norms uh, from the social and cultural context just to get out from it as far as what you are doing is right be determined focused on what you want to achieve and to achieve towards it and more than everything one thing that i would like to emphasize is it's okay for women to ask for help like generally but whether it's spoken or not spoken so many women are facing so many difficulties but they are not asking for help so they should come out and ask for help be independent and to teach their children also to be independent thank you for that and be there if you could add on to that um <laughs> could you say the more political thing and say that um uh, women's day was actually international working women's day that is the foundation of it and when whenever women's day rolls around every year we make it a point to refer to that history as well so if in when people ask us for advice on how to create a program on women's day we always say just pay the women you hire um so that is i think one message i really want to put out uh, that we don't believe in sort of volunteer culture if someone does something as we we at least if i we have a 5000 rupee honorarium we give we say very sorry this is what we can afford can we offer this for your time and your um, expertise so on international working women's day for this month i would like to ask companies and organizations to think about paying women hire women um refer okay. to women and cite women that's that's true i would actually agree with you on that again thank you very much you've come to the end of our program as well thank you for taking the time to having this discussion with me and being a part of the gen x y z program and that was our episode on gen x y z this week join us again next week with another episode that will interest you based on the youth as well just in case you couldn't watch us on air you can always rewatch on our youtube page youtube.com/otherthanenglish i'm so Zanshanadi have a good night